The Shooting Range. In this episode, the small company called Porsche and what they were doing during World War II. Mouse, scary and totally useless. Hotline. The developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the story of Ferdinand Porsche. For a long time, we wanted to tell you about this designer in our Pages of History section. But there was just too much to discuss. So for this one, we've decided to step away from our usual format and use the whole show to talk about him and his work. Except for the hotline, of course. Meet Ferdinand Porsche, a famous Austrian designer who created lots of different cars from the famous Beetle to racing supercars. During World War I, he was also involved in creating military vehicles from cars and aircraft engines and to traction units for moving heavy weapons off-road or via railroads. He didn't have any higher education, but for his war successes he received an honorary doctorate from the Vienna University of Technology. And then the real fun began. In 1931, Ferdinand Porsche founded a company after his own name. It was basically a construction bureau that created blueprints for their clients' orders. They had almost no production assets, just a workshop and a small garage. But what they did have was a team of outstanding engineers picked personally by Ferdinand Porsche. The most notable invention of the company in the 30s was probably the people's car, the Volkswagen Beetle, and its wartime modifications, the Kubelwagen and the Schwimmwagen. Working on those projects, Porsche became more friendly with Hitler, who respected the designer very much. He also made friends with Fritz Tort, who later became head of three ministries. Those connections got the Porsche company into tank designing. In the late 30s, this branch of the German industry was shaky. By the start of World War II, the army still hadn't received its heavy tanks, though they'd already been in development for almost three years. The new modifications of the Panzer I and II were also late, and the situation with medium tanks was a complete disaster. The Panzer III Ausf E had a lot of quality and production problems. As a result, the army was almost without a main medium tank at the beginning of the war. The blame was on the German Army Weapons Agency, also known as the Heereswaffenamt, or HWA. As you might have guessed, Hitler totally hated those guys for not doing their job as they should have done. In September 1939, Hitler and Fritz Tort found a way to change the situation. They established the Third Reich's Tank Commission, headed by none other than Ferdinand Porsche. It operated outside HWA's jurisdiction and not only evaluated tanks, but also created them. A month later, the Daimler-Benz company got the right to work independently on the new medium tank that would replace the Panzer III. After another few months, Fritz Tote became the Reich Minister for Armaments and Munitions. At first, the tank commission was only evaluating the projects of other companies. The first order for creating its own tank came as early as December 1939. They had to design a new heavy tank with a mass of about 25 to 30 tons to replace the Panzer IV. The project combined the work of a whole bunch of manufacturers, including the one that belonged to Ferdinand Porsche. When the tank was ready, he gave it a second name aside the usual production number, the Leopard. This was the start of a new tradition, giving animal names to German tanks. By the way, another variant of this tank was proposed by Henschel Werks, but Porsche's tank had better guns, so it got to production. The requirements were becoming steeper, and they made so many updates that eventually the Leopard turned out to be a whole new tank. It was heavier, slower, and more powerful. Using the analogy, they called it the Tiger. Throwing common sense aside, they started producing it without any tests and prototypes. 
Of course, the tank turned out to have a whole load of initial problems and principal flaws. But the production already began, and they had to correct all those on the fly, which totally screwed the production plan. They were going to assemble 76 Tiger Ps from April to October 1942, and they managed to get only 10 of those. On the other hand, the competitors from Henschel had a load of troubles as well, and they also failed to meet their production plan. After this failure, the Tiger P assembly paused for comparative tests with the Henschel variant. The Porsche tank proved to be a bit better, but the production was still shut down, and the chassis became a base for the new Ferdinand tank destroyers. Rumor has it that the Tiger P project was shut down because of the bad electric transmission, but the decision turned out to be mostly political. Fritz Tort had already died by that time and Porsche didn't get on well with the new Reich Minister, Albert Speer. The HWA saw the opportunity to push their own tanks into production. As for the electric transmissions, the Germans liked them so much they issued twice the planned number of those. Keep in mind, it was wartime and copper wasn't easy to come by. At the same time, Germany started developing the Panthers. As the head of the tank commission, Ferdinand Porsche was one of those who evaluated the prototypes to decide which one should be produced. This time, the commission approved the project by the Mann Company. By the way, they planned to use the same electric transmission as the Tiger P. But Porsche persuaded Hitler that it would be too difficult to mass-produce, and the Panthers got a simplified transmission. Ferdinand Porsche wasn't only supervising the development of new tanks, he also participated in field tests, but a lot of his work never made it to the front line. In winter 1941, Porsche and other leading experts of tank designing arrived at the Eastern Front to examine Soviet and German tanks in action. Using this information and borrowing some ideas from the early T-34s, the companies Porsche and Krupp worked together to develop a new tank using the Tiger P as a base. They managed to correct most of the issues found in the previous model, but the production still got closed even before the field tests. In 1942, the Porsche company started developing air-cooled diesel engines for tanks and other military vehicles. Despite popular belief, diesel fuel was not only used in the fleet. To simplify the production and repair process, the government ordered the creation of a line of standard diesel engines for vehicles. But they managed to successfully test a heavy tank engine only by the end of the war, when there was no point in producing it. This project also gave life to the diesel engine for the RSO. By the way, those tractors were another good piece of tech created by the Tank Commission. When the Tigers and Panthers went into production, the government decided to stop using the Panzer III and IV. But that would leave the army without a light Caterpillar chassis. So, the HWA ordered the Porsche and Rheinmetall companies to create a multi-purpose tank able to hit ground and air targets. Rheinmetall created the turret with a 55mm gun. Porsche created an original chassis. The concept was quite unusual and contained a lot of interesting ideas. Still, this tank never got to production either. We can't talk about Ferdinand Porsche and not remember another quite interesting topic to discuss. The Super Heavy Tanks. In March 1942, the Tank Commission, led by Ferdinand Porsche, received an order to create a tank with a mass of about 100 tons. The Porsche company had the first rough plan ready by June of the same year, and Hitler loved it. 
For the Project VK100.01, they planned to use a suspension from the Tiger, an electric transmission and a similar diesel engine to that of the Tiger. Another project was presented by the Krupp company, but their Lion couldn't compete with Porsche's Maus, so it was abandoned. Still, Krupp got to develop a turret for the new tank. And what they did to it. The tank didn't have any protection from infantry, and the government decided that a simple machine gun wouldn't be enough. No, they wanted a 75mm gun for that. The Krupp company got creative and used the tank turret as a base for another turret, where they mounted the wanted weapon. The tank also received new armor and got heavier, up to 140 tons. But it didn't stay that way for long. After a couple of months, Krupp designed another turret that weighed 57 tons itself, like a whole tiger. And when Porsche created the new chassis for this one, the overall weight of the mouse went up to 150 tons. Then they decided to move the turret to the tail of the tank and place the engine in the middle. After all the corrections, the tank weighed 170 tons and Porsche engines already couldn't power such a heavy vehicle. So they switched to engines by Daimler-Benz. The last problem was with the suspension. To mount the one made by Porsche, you'd have to drill a lot of holes in an extremely thick armor. In the whole of Germany, there was only one manufacturer able to do that, the Krupp company, and they used a unique tool for that. If anything happened to it, the mouse couldn't be built. The solution came from the Skoda company that developed a simple and comfortable suspension that was very easy to mount. The final version of the mouse weighed 188 tons, and it could only be assembled when a whole range of companies combined their expertise. They only built two prototypes, one with a diesel engine and one with a gasoline one, and none of those ever fought in a war. But the tests proved that despite a completely absurd task, Porsche designed an absolutely real working tank. Completely useless, eh, but what the heck. After the war, Ferdinand Porsche and his company returned to tank designing. A prototype of the first German MBT was built totally under their supervision. And as the first ever tank of this company, it received the name Leopard. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from the data chip. Will you ever add the A10 Warthog? Hey mate, can't confirm or deny. It's a bit early to talk about that. A player called Saba Almos de Bretni, hope we pronounced it right, asks, are we going to see the Ju 287 sometime? Chances are that you actually will. We remember about this one, but not in the near future, that's for sure. Then there is this line from Nine, You'd better add a baguette decal. Hello there. As always, we plan to add a decal in honor of the closed beta of the French planes. But what it'll be, we can't say yet. You'll see it all in the news on our site. Efficience asks, if you do read them all, please answer. Will War Thunder ever make its way to Xbox One? As you can see, we actually really truly, absolutely do read them all, and yes, as you probably already know, we just announced the release of the Xbox One and Xbox One X version last week. And the last one comes from Arfinus. Happy birthday, War Thunder. Thank you. And thank all of you guys for playing our game for all these five years. It wouldn't be possible without you. Well, that's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. 
If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.